Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya wal mursalin walhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Praise be to Allah, the cherisher and the sustainer of the world and blessing be on our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his family and his companions. In order to gain blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let us begin uh, the program by recitation of Ummul Kitab Al-Fatihah. Amin amin ya rabbal alamin. Yang bahagia Profesor Emeritus Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak, Director of IIUM. My respectful uh, Datuk Abdul Rahim Ahmad, the Executive Director of Management Service uh, Divisions of IIUM. All IIM universities, uh, management committee members, deans, directors, and administrative officers, the top management and senior official from other Malaysian public universities, government agencies, and staff associations, uh, brothers and sisters. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, salam sejahtera and warm welcome to the IIM Leadership Talks Series Number One, 2020. Um, first and foremost, I am honored to welcome um, our beloved director, Professor Amadita Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak, for taking part in this leadership uh, talk series. Thank you for making time uh, to be with us, uh, Tan Sri. Uh, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, the IIM Leadership Talk Series is a signature program which is organized by the Management Service Divisions and it is collaborated together with IIUM Professional and Management Association, PMA. And it is a platform where we can share wisdom, thought and advice from the great leaders, especially from the education sector, as well as the corporate organizations. Last year, the organizer managed to conduct four series of leadership talks, which were conducted and attended by IIM community in the campus. However, Today's session is a very special event uh, because uh, our program is viewed through a Zoom platform and as well as the YouTube live streaming from our IIM website, not only attended by our staff, IIM staff community, but also can be viewed and assessed by our colleagues from other universities in Malaysia and our partners from abroad. Indeed, with this new norm due to the pandemic situations, the online platform has become an essential tools for academic to share knowledge. Alhamdulillah, now we are able to share knowledge with anybody from various places in the world. Distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, without further ado, I am honored and pleased to invite Yang Bahagia Professor Amrita Stansri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak, Director of IIUM, to deliver his talk entitled The Essence of Resilient Leadership and How to Stay Resilient. By Tafadal Mashkura Tansri. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Yat. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu syafi'il anbiya musyalin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Let me first of all uh, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this opportunity uh, to meet uh, online. Uh, it is my first time doing this and you need to uh, uh, understand that this is something that I'm learning also uh, to give a talk to a camera without seeing uh, the audience uh, uh, listening to, to, to my talk and I hope they are there uh, inshallah. Uh, this is also an opportunity for me to thank uh, MSD for taking uh, the uh, interest in uh, continuing the leadership talk that we have started uh, last year so that this idea of trying to impart leadership characteristic uh, uh, virtues and so on and so forth become the mainstay as far as I am concerned in trying to build an organization that all of us can be proud of. Yeah? Uh, the title that was given to me indeed is very, very uh, opportune uh, given the situation we are in, the coronavirus outbreak that all of us have experienced at least for the month and know what this is all about. Yeah? So I'm trying to structure the talk in a way that it 
affects us in our experience uh, as far as the MCO is concerned and how do you actually look at leadership from that point of view, from that lens, so that we begin to craft another idea of what resilience is all about. I think the word resilience leadership is not new, but it is in the context of a different uh, era where it's, everything is normal, that you have some choices to do. Uh, but here, perhaps under the current situation, your, your choice are limited and therefore we need to relook or understand or revisit what this idea of resilience is all about in order to stay relevant given uh, the situation we are in, which will not end. Uh, I think in the shortest period of time, some people say we will be here until the year 2022, and that means another two years. And therefore, how do you actually craft uh, leadership and how do you actually move on in, to make sure that we are still relevant in this particular context? Yeah? So I would like to thank uh, MSD for giving me this opportunity. And I also would like to uh, thank all of you who have taken time and uh, interest in sharing some of these thoughts of mine. So let, let us begin by, by, by looking at uh, a few uh, ideas or statement that is uh, related to this talk. All right. I would like to start with statements which is probably uh, common to us. Uh, when we talk about what you do has far greater impact than what you say. Normally, we say actions speak louder than words. Yeah? So that is one of the frame that I'm going to use. That in the context of res resiliency, I think we are more interested in what you can convey, in what you can uh, impact, rather than just saying words that has very little meaning in the context of this uh, the mic, uh, no coronavirus that we are facing today. What is it that we can do? What is it that we can demonstrate so that people begin to understand what leadership is all about and what resiliency is all about in this particular context? Yeah? Uh, this is coming from a, a well-known author, Stephen Covey, the book of uh, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Person. But there's another thing that I also want, want to share with you as a kind of a framework for this talk. This comes from Albert Einstein, who is not known for leadership as such. But he made, I think, a very pertinent statement by saying, setting an example is not the main means of influencing others, he said, it is the only means. In other words, exemplary action is what we are talking about. Not just any action, not just anything that we want to do, but that action has to be exemplary so that it will touch people's hearts, people's mind, so that people will begin to look at the example as something that will motivate them and also inspire them to move on, to make a difference in the context, what, again, what we are facing today. How do you actually make this happen is where I think this whole idea of resilience or resilient leadership becomes an important and important domain, right? So, so I would like to start by, by what, would you, what do we mean by setting example? And how do you then use this example as a way to craft up this leadership that is based on resiliency? That will be the kind of approach that I will do as we move on into this, uh, into this talk, inshallah, in the next 45 minutes, in the 45 minutes or so. Now, resiliency, I think, has its own meaning. And let's look at what do we mean by resiliency in the context of crisis. Before that, I want you to understand resiliency becomes very, very much uh, uh, applicable, very much wanted when you face a crisis. Because this is where all of us are inundated with experiences that actually uh, put us in a split, in a state of unstable, uh, in a state of uh, uncertainty, in a state of perhaps, you know, uh, disruptive, that we need to find a bearing where we can make do with what we've got. And therefore, the crisis state is an important state where you want to apply resiliency in this particular context. Yeah? But as the Chinese word for crisis, which is a two-word combination of danger and opportunity, I would want to stress on for every crisis, although there is an element of danger, but we need to see how we can use that element to turn it into opportunities. 
And therefore, we want to look at crises in a positive sense rather than just a negative sense and leverage on the opportunity that is presented to us sometimes is an unlimited way of how to make things better as we moved on. And this is, I think, an opportunity that is a chance of a lifetime. When we talk about the coronavirus outbreak, you will begin to see there are many blessings that is embedded in this coronavirus uh, outbreak that we can use as an opportunity to leverage, to move forward, and in fact, to change the whole landscape of what we've been experiencing for a long time to make it better as we move forward. But to do that, this is where I think the context of leadership becomes important. How do you begin to understand the word leadership given the crisis situation, given the opportunity that you need to leverage on, and how do you actually make this happen? So for that, let us start and understand what res res resilience is all about. Yeah? It comes from a Latin word, which means to spring back, to come back from where you are in a situation which is equivalent to what it was, or in fact, better in the state. Mechanically, you can talk about something that is like a spring that will bounce back, and that bouncing back is part of resiliency. Now, as far as we human is concerned, when we talk about resiliency, is our ability to recover, uh, to move back into a state where we have been put in a very uncomfortable way, in a very disruptive way, in such a way that we are not overwhelmed, we are not succumbed by those states of affair. In other words, you are still very rational in your thinking. You are still very, very clear in what you want to do, that it does not disrupt your life at the same time. Now, this is something which is very, very different from what we understand when we talk about disruptive technology, for example. Often when we talk about disruptive technology, we human beings are supposed to be uh, subservient to it. For example, when you talk about a technology in the context of your uh, devices, yeah, most of us somehow or other become quote unquote slave to those devices as though we have been overwhelmed by those devices. Although we have been put in a situation where what we have done before is no longer applicable as far as these devices is concerned. So when we talk about resiliency in this particular context, it is something which is quite different from the disruptive technology or the disruptive paradigms that we always talk, where we need to conform. Here, we do not have to conform in the context of trying to be where we were in trying to keep our humanity, in trying to keep our values, and also trying to be as human as possible, despite whatever happens. And I think that's a main differentiation that I want to make when we talk about resiliency in the context of leadership, as we are going to uh, embark on this earlier. Why the difference? The difference is because in the context of resiliency, as far as leadership is concerned, there are values attained to it. And here he says that the, some of the values or some of the characteristics that we need to have to be resilient, resilient as a leader is courage, strength, will, tenacity, discipline, and faith. It is not just something that you follow because everybody else is doing it. It is not because it is fashionable to do it. It is not because you are forced to do it, but this is something that we need to have a kind of a value base and that value is the one that will decide whether you will be resilient, whether you be successful as a leader that embark on resiliency as such. Yeah? So this value is the one that I want to emphasize throughout the talk. We must have a basic value that will make us a leader that at the end of the day, will be able to decide whether we want to move forward or whether we want to take some certain action based on the value that we have inherited to move forward as part of the resiliency movement as such. Yeah? So please bear this in mind because we will come back to this idea of values as part and parcel of the leadership that we are going to talk about as we move on. Now, for example, we know when we talk about uh, leadership, uh, we always also focus on failures. Now, people always say failure is something that we cannot get rid of. 
indeed, failure, you have to understand it is part of success. In other words, we will not be successful until we experience failure. And that failure is a failure of the positive type where resiliency becomes part and parcel of the inspiration to make you move forward. Yeah? So failure in this particular context does not come because you fall down or because you're not able to, uh, to, to, uh, many, uh, to, to cope with a situation. Failure will only happen when you are not able to respond to it. And the responding part of it is where these values on resiliency becomes an important tool for us to move forward. Yeah? So people normally say, you don't quit. Not only you don't quit, but you will do whatever you need to do so that you go on doing what is right as far as moving forward to be a resilient leader, as it were. Now, let us come back to the situation we are in today. I think we have not seen how the virus looks like, but that probably is a good uh, kind of uh, uh, metaphor of how this virus is all about. Yeah? Now, not only this virus, but this virus has, until now, imposed on us many things. And the two things that I want to focus on is a question of lockdown. Lockdown meaning that we are beginning to limit our ability to respond. Movement, mobility, and sometimes connectivity, and so on and so forth, in such a way that as a leader, we do not have the luxury of choice anymore. And this is where I think the value of being resilient becomes important. And this is where I think we're going to build this whole idea of uh, leadership based on resiliency and remaining uh, relevant as we move forward in trying to reshape the future. This is something that all of us has, has been listening all the time when we talk about how do we manage uh, the coronavirus. It seems the formula is only about how do you flatten the curve, right? And the context of this is basically we are talking about the kind of resources that we have. We want to spread the resources over as many people who are affected by this so that these resources will also be given to other people who need it at the same time. And therefore, this whole idea of flattening the curve to me becomes another way of thinking of what leadership is all about. Now, if we do not flatten the curve, what does it mean? It means that everybody is for its own. I will develop something that is for my own. There is no collective response. There is no solidarity. There is no working together. And therefore, I only think about myself or my community or my family. All right? But in a situation we are in today, we begin to talk about how do we now begin to work together? How do we begin to collectively respond so that everybody will benefit from what we've got? And this is, I think, the key word or the key ways of trying to understand what this resi resilient uh, leadership is all about. And if we also use this on a momentary basis, in other words, we will not be able to see the end of this because this uh, virus will come back in different form. Bear in mind that this virus also has got its own resiliency in the sense of mutation as we confront this virus, they are also going through the same process. As we try to uh, inhibit their growth, they will mutate, they will become different uh, virus in a different form that will affect us in different ways. So this is an issue that I think we need to stress on when we talk about resiliency and the context of leadership as it were. So the question that we need to ask, to ask ourselves when we talk about physical dis distancing and we talk about social distancing. There are two different concepts altogether. At the moment in time, all of us talk about social distancing. To me, when you talk about social distancing, meaning that you will not have social solidarity. In other words, I will try to move away from people, socially speaking. I, will don't, I don't want to be in contact with them, that's fine. But I also don't want to work with them in the idea of trying to distance ourselves from them. Now, the right word and the right understanding when you talk about leadership is it's not social distancing, it is physical distancing. Physically, 
because of the environment you are given, we are not going to be physically, physically close as before because that could encourage the spread of virus. But that do not mean that socially we need to be also far away from them. So the whole idea of social distancing is not applicable. And when we talk about resilient leadership, we want to talk about social solidarity. When social solidarity comes in, then the chances of being resilient as a community, as a nation, and in fact, as a world become even enhanced. So we need to put this idea of what social distancing and physical distancing is all about, even before we move on. Now, from what I've been hearing, at least in Malaysia, the word social distancing is very much used in a wrong context. If we say Malaysia must social distance itself, then we will not be able to call to, to, to create solidarity. We are not able to work together. We are not going to have this collective response that we want. What we want to do is we want to embrace physical distancing, but we also want to embrace at the same time social solidarity. I think that's the first thing that we need to put right before we go into this whole idea of uh, of uh, what you call resilient leadership, as it were. Okay, until we are able to move together as a group, as a community, and then this whole idea of trying to tackle whatever disruption we've got will not be impactful because of the distancing that we are talking about or practicing, as it were. Now, there is this new document that just came out last month that talk about shared responsibility. You will not have shared responsibility if you practice social distancing. So you need to understand, we need to have social solidarity before we can even have shared responsibility, before we can have in this particular context, global solidarity as such. This came out from the United Nations, but I want to quote one of the statements coming from the United Nations Secretary General on this particular context, trying to give again the framework of what resiliency is all about. Now, he mentioned this, which again, which is common to us, and I think IUM just launched its uh, RCE today. And it, he talks about our roadmap is the 2030 agenda, which is the agenda for education as part of it, and the 17 sustainable development goals. And this statement was made when he launched uh, this particular report on the 7th of April just recently. And the full statement says this, our roadmap is the 2030 agenda and the 17 sustainable development goal. And after that, he will emphasize everything we do during and after this crisis must be with a strong focus on building more equal, inclusive, sustainable economies and society that are more resilient. So here you are, the word resilient has been used by the United, United Nations Secretary General, but in the context of being more equal, in the context of being more inclusive, in the context of creating something which is sustainable, in other words, you are not going to have a curve which is not flattened. We cannot have the luxury of one group having dominating or being dominant in one area, whereas the other group need to suffer because of that disparity or because of that divide or because of that you know, discrimination, as it were. It will not happen in the context of resiliency in the face of the pandemics. Yeah? And what is a translation of this as far as United Nations is concerned? We look at climate change, for example. We look at other global challenges, including the coronavirus itself, which is new, which is not even expected to happen. So the key for all this, from my point of view, is basically until you are able to flatten the curve in the sense that we are all going to be equal, fair, and just, and creating into a sustainable future, then the hope of trying to conquer or trying to defeat this uh, coronavirus outbreak will not be on our side. And hence, this, the understanding of resiliency will be defective as far as the leadership is concerned. Yeah. So taking from this, 
you begin to see sometimes this particular uh, 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 illustration is supposed to talk about we have got social we have got physical uh, uh, social uh, distancing in the sense that everybody is wearing a, 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 a mask now a kind of solidarity that we agree but here we do not have social distancing and other people are still crowding together and therefore you know the spread of the virus becomes even more uh, prominent in the particular case so what i'm trying to put together is basically we need both we need the physical distancing and the social 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 dis, dis, solidarity at, at, at the same time before we can even craft what this leadership on resiliency is all about in the context of the corona virus outbreak that we are facing today all right so let us move on by understanding this whole word of the new normal some people say okay now because we are facing with a new kind of a virus that we do not have any treatment for therefore we need to change our lifestyle and the lifestyle is then crafted as what we call the new normal. The old normal is a normal that perhaps is the one that gives a rise to uh, the outbreak. And therefore, we need to leave those normals and embrace another way of life. And I have a, a, a different view on this when you talk about the new normal, because I think the new normal is basically the old normal being crafted in a different way. And IIUM, for example, when we talk about the new normal, we are using these five other elements that we are talking about. The first normal that we need to understand is about cleanliness. Now, cleanliness is nothing new. In the context of our religion, Islam, uh, cleanliness is up front, the top priority. Yeah? The very fact that we do wudu is before we pray, to show that cleanliness is important, all right? But when we look around, however, cleanliness is not a priority in our community. I often cite uh, our toilets, for example, yeah? Although we talk about cleanliness, but our toilet is never clean enough. And therefore, when we talk about this new normal, as it were, it is not the new normal. It is the old normal that has not been practiced. And I would, to, would like to coin another word called the renewed normal. Why do I want to do this? Because when you talk about the old normal being put into a new form, there is a kind of resiliency. There is a kind of understanding what we have left behind and will help us to bounce back the moment we use that, the moment we embraced it as part and parcel of our lifestyle. I don't want us to think about everything that we have learned before is irrelevant and therefore we need to think of something else so when you talk about cleanliness we only talk about sanitizers for example we only talk about technology for example what we have got and what we have been told before will not be relevant to us and i think this will be a sad day if we are not able to differentiate what was relevant then but not practiced until now that needs to come back in the context of this renewed normal. Yeah? So as you go down the list, for example, cleanliness from now on, if you were to be a resilient leader, that could be, uh, that must be your top agenda. In other words, the res resiliency in trying to make cleanliness as a top agenda must be there in everything that we do, because that will be the key thing that will flatten the curve the key thing that will break the transmission of the virus from animal to human being or even from human being to human being right the next on the list we have got obedience or observant in other words all rules that relates to this must be observed in the context of is part and parcel of the primary duty that we need to do it's just like at the ibadah it's just like the amana that is given to us there is no way of skirting around it because the moment you skirt around it then you are exposing yourself again into whatever outbreak or whatever dangers or challenges that you are facing meaning to say that we need to be vigilant all the time in other words to understand where you are and what is the condition around this and how then you can use some of these values to ensure that you are in a protected way 
looking at the kind of dangers or the situation we're in. For example, if you need to wear a mask, you wear a mask. For example, if you need to distance yourself more than just one meter, you need to do that. Right? So there is this choice that you begin to shape the kind of leadership characteristic that you want to have given the situation because we are vigilant at the particular situation or in the, in the situation you are, you are put into. Yeah? The fourth one is about being consistent, it's the karma, yeah? and understanding that is part and parcel of that resiliency that you're going to embrace at the end of the day, being a leader to move into the, the impactfulness of your practices. Last but not least is discipline. Discipline, in other words, to follow in the order that you are given to make sure that whatever it is done, it is crafted in such a way that it is impactful at the end of the day. So I want to make an argument at the end of the day that we are not caught into this whole idea of new normal because somebody says so. I think we need as a leader to reflect whether the so-called new normal is beneficial to us or is it just another word that has been thrown away because there is also this whole idea of cultural bias when we define what the new normal is. And that I think often enough is not taken into consideration. Let me go into the next slide yeah, uh, to, to, to understand where the values are and therefore these values must be part and parcel of our uh, roots so that we understand where we are going as far as residency is concerned. Now, this is an, an, another, another, another example when we talk about the new normal. Yeah? For a long time, I think in our community, at least in the Western community, or at least between genders, a shaking hand is not a normal for us. All right? It was introduced to us maybe through colonization, maybe through you know, uh, interaction with other communities, that now we begin to think that handshake is the way uh, forward. All right? But because of the coronavirus, because of the outbreak, now somebody has said, no, handshake will not happen anymore because this will be a way of transmitting those virus. And people are saying now, we do not do handshake. And everybody else is do not, not doing handshake anymore. But for us, at least between gender, we do not do handshake. So there is nothing new as far as we are concerned. Yeah. Now we're inventing many other ways of wishing. You can see from, from the picture, either you wave, or you put your hand on the heart, that's where we, are, we used to practice, you use the namaste and so on and so forth. All of this is a kind of a greeting that do not introduce contacts. Now, therefore, when you say this is a new normal, to me, it is not a new normal. It is an old normal that we have forgotten for some reason or the other that now that needs to be brought back. Yeah? Why do I say this? Because then we begin to place the values that we have had for a long time and bring it forward again as part of the resiliency that we want to talk about. Right? I'll give you another example. I think in Japan, for example, yeah? There's never been a contact uh, between two people in the, con in the sense of greeting, right? They will always bow. And there are also different ways of bowing. You bow the most when you are in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sorry state, when you have done something wrong, you need to apologize. You bow slightly higher when you say thank and just hello, a slight bow. Now, I'm trying to, to, to put a picture, for example, we have brought ways of tackling this using our own cultural values, using our own norms, and using our own civilization. They do not have to be defined by the so-called new normal, new normal, as it were. Right? So I want you to understand as we talk about resiliency, values, culture, and civilization make part of this when you want to define what the leadership is all about. Right, so Japanese has got their own understanding of what residency is all about. They say never give up, fall down seven times, get up eight. In other words, within the Japanese culture, this whole idea of residency, fighting, making things better, 
you know that's why they are good in continuous assessment uh, the kaizen and so on and so forth these are all part of the understanding of what resiliency leadership is all about bouncing back creating better solution making better alternative so that they gives you a higher impact as you move on and creating better leadership as far as as far as uh, the japanese is concerned and they now become almost yeah, uh, the, the 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 model as far as leadership is concerned moving forward now let us do this on, on a more general scale i talked to you earlier that there are values that you need to you need to attach to in the context of religiously not just something which which is mechanical right so the values that we talked about are the six values one is will tenacity strength courage discipline and faith now to be resilient you must have the will you must have the tenacity you must have the the, 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 the determination to put things right by taking on a different approach altogether yeah in other words when you are down when you are being challenged we when you are stressed you cannot take this as though this is the final outcome of what you do you need to fight back and to fight back you must have that will power to fight back yeah and that will power is determined on the kind of determination that you have that is built on the strength that you have got in other words you need to recognize what your strength is not just your weaknesses i think your weaknesses perhaps is taken uh, care by the challenges that you are not able to respond but you also must understand what your strength is and that is the strength that all of us must recognize as part and parcel the, the courage that we need to develop to move forward right when we talk about leadership from my point of view from the little that i see most leaders do not have courage most leaders when they are confronted with issues that is disadvantage to them they are not able to vocalize or articulate or make sure that their point of view are understood so that they are not disadvantage i think in the in the context of the corona virus you see many things that are now pushing you to a state that you are sometimes unable to respond or not wanting to respond so the elements of courage to be resilient the elements of courage is important to me perhaps is absolutely important because that's where you begin to push back and this is where the elements of discipline becomes an important element because you need to do it as part and parcel of that strategy to be a leader that will move resilience forward and then it becomes part and parcel of your belief it becomes an part and a parcel of the kind of strategy that is engraved or embedded in your leadership style that you need to push back when you need to push back remember when i talked about earlier when you talk about setting examples you begin to set your own examples so that other people will recognize that these are leadership that will not take things lying down i in fact they will fight back they will need to fight back because of the believe that you have got that you need to do right that you need to give justice that you need to be fair but you need to fight back because of those natures those values that we talked about yeah so the six values to me is important if you want to be resilient yeah you must have the will power you must have the determination you must know where your strengths are you must craft it into a kind of a courage and that courage is based on total discipline so that you are not scared to move you so are not you are not caught by people who say something that will probably threaten you and that is where your belief becomes the moving factor to be a resilient a, a resilient uh, leader yeah and all of this must act in a tandem it cannot be just one and the rest do not work it must be in a tandem that there is a balance yeah between what you think and what you feel within what your mind says and what your heart says people often talk about mindfulness but we are also going to talk about heartfulness these two elements must work together in the in the sense of trying to create the resiliency that you are wanting to move forward as a leader as it were 
this is why I think at the end of the day, we want to talk about resiliency as a mode of creating a balanced lifestyle. We are not going to do resiliency just for the sake of it. There is an end point why we want to take resiliency to a point that it will create a balanced lifestyle so that that lifestyle become the norm of how we're going to live forward. We are not going to create another, another curve that needs to be flattened. Yeah, as you can see just now, if you don't do residency in a balanced way, you create another curve that will deprive others of fairness, justice, and equitability. So this whole idea of, of residency is coming back to how do you actually create a lifestyle that is balanced, a management way of that is balanced, a leadership in a context that is balanced. Now, we have seen when everything is gone out of balance or in balance, the challenges is what we see today. Part and parcel of this whole issue of the coronavirus is, I believe, a life that is imbalanced. Let me give an example. Yeah? If it is true that it comes from a wet market in a place in China, what is the imbalance? In the imbalance is that we do not only now talk about what we consume. There is an imbalance in the way we consume things. And that imbalance of consumption has now created another kind of a problems that we need to deal with, not only because of you, but because of the spread of everything around the world. So this whole idea of creating a balance out of this resilient leadership is something that I think it is important as an end point. You don't want to bounce back and create another imbalance yeah, in the context of uh, moving it too far ahead out of the curve that we have talked about earlier. Yeah? So this whole idea of climate change, terrorism, uh, political distancing, uh, the kind of illness we see are all examples of the lifestyle which is imbalanced. In other words, we have lost also that resiliency leadership that we talked about earlier. Now, how do you then move from there? Yeah? The only way I think is to learn again about resiliency. And what is the best way to learn is to look at nature. Because nature is endowed with this element of resiliency as part and parcel of how nature survives. As you can see around us, no matter how much beating that nature is given, at the end of the day, they will survive. This is a picture that I took a year after wild, wildfires. Normally wildfires will destroy everything. But at the end of the day, because of the resiliency that nature provides, you find that things are beginning to grow again. And it is not because we human make sure that they grow. They grow on their own. And this is where I come back to the whole idea of the internal strength, the internal courage that we are endowed with that will allow us to grow again if we put this in the context that is supposed to be, that is supposed to be there. Right? I want to go into a very specific idea as a kind of a metaphor. Yeah? Here is a metaphor that says, storm makes tree takes deeper roots. All right? uh, to me, it's a very meaningful metaphor. As you are you know, undergoing through storm, and sometimes the tree needs to bend, yeah? but you find that the tree do not break. Why? Because they are very well rooted. To me, well-rooted means the value that you possess are strong enough to make sure that you do not break. Despite all the challenges, you are able to be in that, in that determination that we talked about, the strength that you have, and also the courage to push back and to make it better. Right? So what does he say here? Yeah. When life's strong winds come blowing, bend with them and let go. In other words, there are times as leaders, you need to give way. There are times as leaders, you need to allow and so, so, for some compromise so that you are not broken. And that doesn't mean that you are taking a step backwards. That is just a strategy for you to allow things to happen before you re respond according, accordingly. Yeah? By bending, you will become stronger in new places. In other words, by 
compromising or taking a compromise, you are developing another way of looking or strategically thinking of how to move forward. In others, you have built another new capacity so that that capacity will be the new strength or the new courage for you to move forward. It is not just taking it as though you have now receded into a path that you will not be able to push forward. In fact, it is a con in the converse. You learn what is good and therefore you begin to take on a different strategy and a different strength. By letting go, you will make new rooms for the new and the better. Again, yeah? And when you talk about the new and the better, this is where people are beginning to talk about the new normal. The new normal is something which is really very new that you begin to add on to the tools or the, 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 the strategy that you have. This will be then something that you can leverage as you move into a new situation without forgetting the old norms and the old value that I stressed to you earlier. Yeah? So I like this metaphor because you see trees around you all the time. And the trees will remind you that this is part and parcel of nature's resiliency. And if we are part of nature, then we must be endowed with the same resiliency, except that we do not practice it. Except that sometimes we do not even care about this resiliency because we are so out of touch with nature, with nature as such. Yeah? A good example is in this particular case. I just want to uh, illustrate here you can see here there's a very stormy uh, day or stormy night here. Yeah? But this man here needs to hold on to a tree because this tree is rooted. This man metaphorically, metaphorically is not rooted. If he let go of the tree, he will be blown away. Yeah? So I want to emphasize again, to be rooted to values is something that is so useful before we even talk about resiliency, because at the end of the day, the resiliency must have a reference, and that reference point is where your roots are in the context of values. This, I think this picture is, is something that is familiar to all of us. Yeah? Uh, we are asked to observe lockdown. Yeah? What does lockdown mean? Lockdown means we are taking away ourselves from the larger picture that we are always engaged with. Yeah? We are supposed to stay home, right? But staying home does not mean that we are giving up. I think this is the message that needs to be delivered. Yeah? Staying home does not mean that we are giving up, we are taking easy things easy, but staying home means we are beginning to think, Oops. to plan, and also to structure things to move forward, right? So staying home here means you need to practice the six elements that I talked to you about. How do you build your willpower, your determination? How do you build your strength? How do you build your courage? And how do you build your belief? In the translation that we've got, you used to use masks. You need to wash your hand. You need to not to touch your face or all the things that we mentioned to us over, over and over again, right? Why is this important? Because that is part and parcel of building that resilience within yourself that you will then be able to master and fight against the coronavirus, not in a physical sense. Yeah? You will not be able to win this battle against the coronavirus in a physical sense as our auntie is trying to do here. All right? So in resilient leadership, it is more a strategic way of moving forward by building your own capacity by building your own, uh, what you call willpower, as I've mentioned to earlier, not something that you want to demonstrate in the sense of physically, because the enemy that you are fighting is the enemy that you will not be able to see. Okay? And Al-Ghazali summarizes very well when he talks about fighting an enemy that you do not see. He says you need to get rid some of the enemies within you, things like egoism, things like uh, conceitedness, things like greed, things like lust. All these are the enemies that you need to clean up so that your strength and your willpower becomes even more enhanced to fight those kind of enemies moving forward. It is not something that is directly 
as, as a kind of a, a physical fight that you see in this particular context. Yeah? So the idea of a lockdown in this particular case has got its own meaning to us. And this is where I think we need to talk about again in the context of this flattening the curve so that the curve that is flattened because we have taken an action to redistribute, to create justice and to be equitable in the, in the long term as far as the community is concerned. Right? If you look at bamboo as a kind of a nature's way of teaching what resiliency is all about, there's much to learn from this. Yeah? Just look at bamboo alone. What has nature given them? Yeah? They all grow very high. When they bend, they will bend, but they, will do not, they do not break. Bamboos in such a way that they grow again in, in clusters. You seldom find bamboos grow alone. They grow in clusters. This is a social solidarity that we talked about. When they grow in clusters like that, they become stronger. When the wind blows, they will bend, but they do not break. I think that's the first lesson that we need to learn as far as resiliency from nature is concerned. Secondly, they are very deeply rooted. Again, we go back to the idea of roots. We go to the idea of values. We go to the idea of what we believe in that will be our push uh, back factor when we, need, when we are challenged or we are pushed uh, to, to, to take a different path. Yeah? But yet they are flexible. They are not rigid. Sometimes I know we have got belief, but our belief is so rigid that the moment we are pushed, we break because there is no flexibility in the way we, we, we manage our beliefs. And I think that flexibility is something, again, that is important, right? But more importantly, if you look at bamboo, inside bamboo is hollow. You would probably think bamboo, because it's tough, is a solid thing inside. Yeah? That hollowness, to some people, is a mark of wisdom. In other words, you are not preoccupied with something that actually distracts you. Your mind remains open. Your mind remains uh, uh, flexible in trying to consider other alternatives and other solutions using these elements of wisdom that we talked about. When I talk about wisdom, I talk about two things. One is a flexibility of thinking that gives you different solution, different uh, point of view, different strategy, and you are also adaptable to it. That adapti the adaptability will give you that uh, leeway of trying to find a way out when you are met with certain conditions as such. At the end of the day, what this means to me is basically how humble we are in trying to find a solution by adapting to whatever is available as long as the value system remains the same. We are not going to be very rigid because it will not solve the problem that rigidity presents a, a kind of a breaking point in many parts of the decision making as, as we move, if move forward. So bamboo to me uh, gives a very good example, a reminder of what resiliency is all about, what sort of leadership characteristic that we want to take on when we want to move into uh, a, a, a disruption as we are facing in, in today. It also means, when we talk about wisdom, it also means that the mind must be at a state that it can be operationalized because it is not muddled with certain things. Yeah? There is another proverb that I want to introduce. It is only in still water we can see things. Now, when we are faced with challenges as big as the coronavirus, we must have a clear mind so that we know what the solution is all about. Here is, a, here is a picture metaphorically done for you. When the water is clear, you can see the fish swimming under the water. Right? It means to say that we are able to go in depth of what we are supposed to see and what we are supposed to capture as a proper solution to our, to our uh, problem, as it were. So we must practice and we must know how to keep the mind still in trying to find a solution. You don't go into a state of anxiety. You don't go into a state of mental health that will distract you. You don't go into a state of depression or whatever it is, but you must keep your mind in a healthy state. And that is, I think, part and parcel 
of this resiliency as uh, leadership uh, that, that we talked about, right? Now, the contrast to this, we cannot see our reflection in running water. Imagine there is a running water, yeah? Unlike the first picture where we can see fishes swimming below it, when your mind is muddled, you are not able to transcend those values and see where you are in the context of trying to find to find to trying to find a solution. So what it means that before you go into a resilient leadership, you must have got the capacity to actually keep your mind in an open state, to keep your thinking in an unmuddled state, because that will be the strength that you will need to use as you want to look for a solution moving out of the challenges that you are in. Okay. So I would like just to, to probably just summarize that in building resiliency, there are many ways of doing it. Yeah? But in the context of what we are now facing, the lockdown context, we are, as I've mentioned, have very little option, externally at least, but internally the action is still very much available to you if you are able to harness this. Let us, let us uh, take an example. Yeah? In the lockdown situation, we have seen emotion becomes a very vulnerable state. I listened to one professor of psychiatry, I think over the CNN, that talks about, at least in the United States, as far as con she's concerned, uh, the, the, what you call, the stress level has gone up 900%. In our own university, you begin to see this. Yeah? So this is a case where we find that in a, in a situation of a lockdown, we become very vulnerable emotionally. And once you're vulnerable emotionally, then your leadership, your resiliency will also go out at the same time. So how do you maintain that is another uh, another. Uh, what we call a, a way of uh, looking how to build this reason. Some people will relate it to, to, to spirituality, meditation, contemplativeness, are all a way to manage this. And I think that's another skill that you need when you talk about this resilient sea uh, leadership, as it were. Right? We talk about uh, the ecology, for example. Under lockdown, we begin to see the ecological change begins to, to, to see very differently. Yeah, I think there are reports saying that there are now uh, uh, no longer uh, pollution the way we see it uh, before, the, before the, the lockdown. Yeah? Some of the rivers are clean and so on and so forth. What does it mean? It means that the moment we control our needs and our greed, we begin to shape different environment. And that the environment will be the environment that eventually will be a plus point to us when we talk about realism moving forward. Yeah? We can talk about, we have talked about social distancing, social solidarity as part and parcel of the resiliency of so skills that you need. You need to build that on rather than, you know, uh, leaving it aside. You talk about cultural dimension just now when you talk about handshakes, whether we need to take this as a new normal or the renewed normal or the old normal. These are something, again, that is up in question when we, want, we are in a situation of the lockdown. Economy is another one. I think most of us, when we look at this coronavirus, at the end of the day, we'll look at this as an economic crisis rather than a humanitarian crisis. Yeah? So we allow people to go and, and do shopping, although sometimes it threatens more death, because to us, economy is more important than life at a certain point. So I think, again, yeah, in the context of resilient leadership, you need to make the balance that I mentioned to you about. How do you balance economic needs and the humanitarian needs in the context of trying to uh, build a new future, as it were? So in the context of lockdown, the resiliency understanding how to build a leadership becomes an important uh, decision that we need to make. And here is where I think we want to introduce our own idea of what this resiliency is all about in the words of our own indigenous word, that is the system the Sajatra Initiative. We are going to talk about the Sajatra Initiative that takes care of the seven next, of the ten nexus of spiritual, ethical, emotional, intellectual, and psychological, and the rest of it. How do you then assemble this as part and parcel 
of the makeup or the leadership that will want to practice resiliency moving forward as a kind of a solution. We, we know this word sejahtera, right? But I don't think we fully understand it. Yeah, We've got the word salam, salam sejahtera. We've got this song sejahtera Malaysia. We've got even terminal uh, in, in the airport at one point called terminal sejahtera. And in Kelantan, you also got a word called tandas sejahtera. I mean, the word has been bandied around. Yeah? But few of us are able to articulate this. And given the lockdown that we are facing today, this word sejahtera has no meaning at all until we reconceptualize it again in, in the way that I'm going to present to you uh, after this, right? So let's start with this whole idea of sejahtera initiative. What do we mean uh, when we talk about it in the form of resilient, resiliency uh, leadership? First of all, I think in, in the sejahtera leadership, we want to talk about us as a human being first, rather than anything else. Because as I mentioned to you, the values that we've got is the values of being human. And being human in the sejahtera understanding is to understand yourself as a spiritual being. Because that's where the value gets embedded. That's where the rooting of the value sits. And that's where the value is able to decide what is ethical and what is not ethical, to decide whether you need to be emotional over it or otherwise. So these three elements of spirituality, emotion and also ethical, make the basis of someone to be resilient in the true words of a, a, of a leader. Right? And where does that come from? That comes from, from the inner context of the human being that makes human and this is the heart or the cup in this particular in this, in this particular case. Yeah? You need to nurture the heart. You need to understand what the heart represents to you as a human being that embraces this three value of spirituality, of emotions, and also of ethics at the same time. Right? That therefore gives us a kind of a framework of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. There's a kind of a framework that tells you what resiliency is all about as far as we are concerned, all right? That defines us and that's defined the kind of a, a framework that we need to work on. Within this framework, then we begin to build other uh, capacity in terms of the intellectual uh, as a human being as well. You talk about the cognitive part, you talk about the psychological part, and you talk also about the intellectual part that breaches the five uh, senses of touch, sign, hear, uh, sight, hearing, smell, and, and taste. But mind you, these do not work alone. The difficulty that we have, or at least I have to understand this, as though the mind and the five senses work alone, and there is no connection between the heart that I talked to you about earlier. How do you connect these two will determine the sign of religiousy that we're able to afford at the end of the day when this connection, when this connection is met. Yeah? Uh, once you make this connection, then you begin, you're able to then perform. On the macro level, how do you want to practice this leadership of yours? in the context of the ecology, the economy, the uh, culture, and also the societal sort of dimension. In other words, you're always safeguarded. You're always guided by the red circle, which is basically the outer limit of what is permissible and what is not permissible before you get out of balance. In other words, coming back to the whole idea of resiliency in this particular context, to keep the balance intact as far as as far as your leadership is concerned right and that balance is a continuous balance it needs not a balance at one time but it's a continuous balance as a lifestyle you must keep this balance ongoing depending on where you are and the situation you are in so that you are not taken out of that particular context if I were to draw this on a, on a, on a, on a side view to give to give us some um, more perhaps uh, an indication of what this is all about, yeah. There you have got 
the connectivity between the, 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 the brain and the heart, which is important uh, as far as uh, these two elements working together. Yeah. That is the one that finally will decide where you are in the context of ecology, where you are in the context of economics, where you are in the context of culture, and where you are in the context of society. The values that is brought out is an inside-out process that we decide what is apt for the ecology, the economy, the culture, and the society at the same time. In other words, you are always in control to ensure that the balance is always there. And that is where I think the idea of trying to be resilient, because you know what the limits are, and therefore you can always bounce back, because the moment you uh, exceed or transgress those limits, the heart will signal you that you are now moving away from the balance to the imbalance, and you quickly then will co correct yourself to be bare where you are in the state of balance as such. Yeah? Uh, otherwise, we are in this particular state now. Yeah? We are working only on the five senses, all right? Mentally, and beginning to operate on just one dimension, as I mentioned to you earlier, the economic dimension. You are not taking the balance of the other three of the ecology, the society, and also the culture. Already, we are in a state of imbalance as a human person because the other dimensions are not taken care and we are already in the state of imbalance. And this is why we go into the, 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 the excesses of life very quickly because the state of balance is no, is no longer there. And how do you restore this is where we need to come back and understand this resiliency that I talked to you about. Let me try and, and, and summarize that. Yeah? So to start off with, I think before you go into this resiliency citizenship, you need to recognize who we are. And these are the 10 elements that I talked to you about. Yeah? The cognitive, the cultural, the ecological, the emotional, ethical, economics, and the societal. And if you assemble this word well, you end up with the word spices, right? From spiritual right down to the society. How you work as a micro, uh, uh, in a, mi a macrocosm into the microcosm from the individual to the society at large. And this, uh, I think it's not clear there, but it's about how do you spice up? How do you actually balance it in the context of this resiliency? So I want to end up by, by just uh, take, taking another quote here. Yeah? People who are resilient, given that kind of a, 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 what do you call a individual understanding, they create a powerful vision, the belief that I talked to you about for their success, and look for the opportunities in all their experience. So it allows you the flexibility, the adaptability, the wisdom that we talked to you about is something that allows you to explore as much uh, opportunity as possible, so the, at the end of the day, we, are e we easily bounce out of the kind of situation we are, we are put into. We can then stay relevant. Yeah? By staying relevant here is an example that we create, not by force, which what I mean is basically, you need to be the first person that leads you. It's difficult to get other people to lead you if you are not leading yourself. Yeah? You earn the right to lead others when, you, when, when they see you lead your own life well. All right? So in other words, it becomes almost an, a natural way of leadership within yourself because you know now how to act, how to limit your action, how to be resilient when the time comes and how to maintain your compost and posture because of the example and not because you are forced to. What do I mean by forced to? I am really worried now that we undergo this, uh, this, uh, uh, this challenge of the corona virus. We conform and we adopt certain things, but it's only for a matter of time. Once this coronavirus is over, 
if it's over at any time point, yeah, then we will go back to where we were. Yeah. Uh, what we used to practice, we will forget it. We will go back to the lifestyle that actually invites other sign of imbalances, other forms of uh, challenges that at the end of the day will put us in the same state of mind once again. Right? So the whole idea of this religious citizenship is for you to enculturate it within yourself so that from now on it becomes a part and parcel of your lifestyle, a part and a parcel of your culture, a part and parcel of your belief that you need to practice this way. Doesn't matter whether there is coronavirus or not, cleanliness is top of the agenda. Doesn't matter if you know uh, there is a challenge, a social solidarity is something that we must maintain. Yeah? Doesn't matter what is the situation, some of these values that we have forgotten needs to be brought back because that defines us in the terms of values as far as we are concerned, as a community, as a human being, as this whole uh, fight against whatever challenges that we move, we are going to move forward. It's not an option anymore. It is something that we need to hold on to because this will define whether we will survive future ahead in times of other uh, outbreaks or other challenges moving forward. And people have been telling us that the coronavirus is not the first and the last. There are many more. It's until and unless we develop this kind of realism that we talked about, then we will not be able to maintain moving forward. My last slide is basically to just conclude this. Yeah? We talk about set goods example. If we set good example as a kind of a uh, as a kind of a practice that we do, then we should be able to strike the balance that I talked to you about. Yeah, the balance of what is possible and what is not possible. What is a limit that you do not transgress, so that you are always in that context of being the human being that will be. Uh, respectable because you maintain the balance within yourself, right? That will then allow you to go into this whole idea of being sajatra, this, the, the ten elements from being spiritual uh, to being psychological to being uh, intellectual, cognitive, cultural, emotional, ethical, economics, and finally to build a kind of society that is that is balanced at the same time. And all of this can only happen if you are rooted on these values that we talked about. Yeah? To be resilient, for example, you need the values of willpower, the, 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 the determination, the strength that you need to build out so that you have the courage to actually push to make things better. You have the courage to be disciplined on certain things yeah? that will be important for us uh, to build a kind of a belief a kind of a faith that will take us forward in, 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 in creating better futures. Yeah? Those are the elements that I think at the end of the day will need to be put together. Connecting the minds and the heart, connecting what is uh, tangible and what is intangible, connecting what is individual and what is communal, yeah? so that we will stay together as a community that will, at the end of the day, look after each other and then make sure that the relationship factor is a factor that at the end of the day will be part and parcel of the solution or if not, the, the what do you call uh, the barrier that will push all other challenges away from us as we move forward into the future. So I, I will stop there. Uh, I hope I've given you some ideas of what this uh, resiliency leadership in the context of a lockdown. Yeah? Uh, otherwise, I think there are other ways of def defining this and uh, looking at the two months or the three months experience when we have a lockdown, when we are compromised in many ways, we are compromised only to the externalities, but not within ourselves, because those are the areas that we need to grow to be part and parcel of this resiliency leadership that we talked about. So on that note, I will stop here. If there's any question, if there's any clarification, if there's any debates, I am uh, quite open to this. So, Assalamu alaikum 
warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Tan Sri, for your insightful thought and given topic. Um, I am sure that everyone has benefited a lot from your talk and input. Uh, if I can uh, pick up some of the points that you have mentioned just now, to be a resilient leader, one must have uh, the ability to recover a bounce back quickly. And uh, in that individual, the leaders must possess or equip with a strong values and it is rooted in the heart. And uh, the last one, uh, uh, that individual or the leaders might perceive failure as an opportunity to improve oneself. Yeah, Tan Sri. Uh, yes, for your information, Tan Sri, uh, Alhamdulillah, um, based on our session, uh, we have uh, almost uh, 200 users uh, reaching us through our Zoom applica applica applications. And uh, it is approximately uh, 50 uh, watch, uh, viewers uh, that view our session through YouTube live streaming. Okay. So this is kind of new norm that I think uh, in the future we will have. Uh, Tansi. Everybody can uh, receive information and knowledge from uh, this kind of uh, sessions. So um, um, I think we can allow some few questions from the Zoom audience. Um, yes. Yeah, Tansi? Yes, please. Um, and then, um, so for, for, for you who like to ask questions, if you look at the uh, menu in your Zoom, um, uh, features, there is a, a icon uh, colored in blue, uh, raise hand, uh, you may uh, click on that and um, you can unmute your microphone and switch on your video camera and uh, you may ask question to our beloved editor. And can you uh, introduce your name and uh, uh, where are you from, uh, which institution or uh, our department. So I would like to open question from the members. I've got a few uh, a few thank you messages, congratulations messages. Thanks for those. Okay. It appears on my screen. Yeah, yeah, we saw it. Tan Sri. Any questions? Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with my screen. It's not working. But uh, if you can hear me, can I pose yes. a, uh, ask yes, a question yes, now? Yes. You yes, can hear. Yes. yes, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Tansri. I'm uh, Visalachi Balakrishnan from University of Malaya. Yes. And um, I'm very, very interested in resilience. It's a value practice in Singapore for centuries. And you realize that um, they're applying it in schools, plus in their workplace and everywhere. I have been pushing for these values in moral and civics education, and hopefully by 2025, we are going to put it officially in our syllabus. Yeah. My main question is, there are conflicts between what you just mentioned in your entire talk about resilience in comparison with um, norms and religious practices. Many of the religions will tell our people that you are supposed to leave it to God, God decides, God is giving you virus, so just leave it to God and God knows what to do. But I realized that you did not bring spirituality into your talk. How do we face um, such problems when we bring resilience to the school system? Because you can't teach resilience at an age where people are too hard. You, you spoke about bullo. And you know the bulo, if you don't bend the bulo when they are young, it's never going to happen. So uh, I need your advice there, Tansri. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I talked earlier, I think I, I make a, a, a particular emphasis that although you believe, but there must be flexibility. You know, uh, that flexibility is not a flexibility to compromise, but the flexibility to understand deeper. Uh, my issue when we talk about religion, I think the depth of understanding is normally very superficial. Yeah, and therefore, when we go into religious classes, we are not allowed to ask questions. And not asking questions means, in other words, you are not able to root deeper. You're not able to understand what is the essence 
of that ruling or that an argument or that understanding that allows us to understand it even better and to make yourself more convinced about this. Yeah? Uh, where you want to do this, I think it's, a, it's, it's just a matter of time. For, for younger children, you probably want to uh, give them a, a kind of a guideline uh, so that they have this flexibility of choice. I'll give you a simple example. I mean, this is my experience when I go to uh, one of the Pasan Tren in, the, uh, in, the, in Gontor. I think most, most of my colleagues have gone to Gontor. Yeah? They have done a very successful Pasan Tren. When they teach the, the, the children, uh, they always give the children a kind of a flexibility to make choices within that red framework that I talked to you about. We already defined the red framework. What is it that you are allowed to do? But within that, they are allowed to make choices. And they are not uh, said, this is A, this is B, and you, you are not allowed to, you know, uh, to, to exchange those. A simple example, I was there for three days and three nights. Yeah? Um, I participated subo with them. Um, the, my first subo, there was no, there was no uh, uh, kunut. Yeah? And my second subo, there was kunut. And my third subo, there was no kunon. Uh, in Malaysia, this will cause a big row. Because you, you don't read kunon, uh, some people may say you're smayang tak sa. And I begin to understand that some people say, banyak orang tak smayang subo pasal dia tak paham kunon. Or tak boleh baca kunon. So they might as well not spray. You know? But here I, I ask the rector, I say, why do you allow this? Sakam man boleh, sakam tak boleh. They kata, look, we have taught our, our imam in such a way that they can make the choice whether they want to read kunut ataupun tidak. You know? Because they have been taught in such a way that that flexibility is within their ambit. And they are not going to define it as such that this must be done in this way and therefore not the other way. So I think that flexibility, I emphasize that flexibility, this is where the bulu is all about. Yeah? The bulu, again, you know, as the bulu grow, uh, there are saying when the, 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 the bulu is so high, but when the bulu grows so high, the bend is even... Yeah? Mananya, the higher you go, the more humble you are. You don't dictate terms to other people, you don't tell people what to do, but yet you open their mind to make decisions on what this decision needs to be made. I use the word spirituality, I, use the, I don't use the word religion. Because religion, we begin to focus on religiosity, and religiosity sometimes misunderstood by people is something just external. The way you dress and you know, the kind you think you, you wear and you begin to judge people from the external. And spirituality to me is something which is quite different. Your external may be something else, but your internal will be something else. Sometimes uh, you don't imagine people who are more pious than uh, without having any external external. Uh, what you call uh, indication that they are pious and so on and so forth. So the choice of words, uh, the kind of uh, the kind of uh, uh, flexibility, uh, I think needs to be put in place. If you don't have that, then we we will not be able to uh, to uh, to bridge this. I, I I I I share your sentiment. I share your sentiment. For example, when you talk about this coronavirus, uh, half of the issues revolves around religion. You know. And we are not sure why this is so, but I guess it's because of that rigidity in, in thinking that we think that we are not allowed to uh, think beyond what we are able to think. I hope I'm right. Did I answer your question? Yes, Tansri. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much, much, Tansri. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you very much. Um, Tansri, we got one uh, question uh, from the Zoom group chat. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Shafiq from USM, Shafiq Aziz. Okay. He is asking you how do we want to be istiqomah in becoming a resilient person or leader? How do we? How do we want to be istiqomah? Well, my understanding of istiqomah is one is of consistency. Yeah. Uh, I think a leader must exhibit this kind of a consistency in principle. All right. In other words, you are not going to be uh, blown left, right, and center uh, just because you want to preserve your position as a leader. All right. And oftentimes, uh, I see this happening. 
people move from left to right because you 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 don't want to vacate uh, your leader your leadership uh, position. Uh, you want to secure that, and therefore your principle also away from life, left, right, the center. In other words, when I talk about that belief earlier, you have no, you don't have a core belief. Your belief is just like uh, what some people say, a chameleon belief. You know, uh, your color changes from time to time. Uh, your color changes from situation to situation. Uh, you don't take a position. Uh, that you are scared to take a position because then you will be compromised in your position as a leader. And I think that's not leadership. I think that's basically a, a cowardice way of uh, being a follower. Yeah, and I think perhaps this kind of people uh, compromise the whole organization at the same time. Uh, you as a leader need to be istikoma in the sense that you hold to a principle. The amanah that was given to you is nothing that you can compromise on. If it's black, then it, is, it remains black. It doesn't matter whether somebody says it's yellow or purple or green, it will remain black and you will defend and that it is black, you know? And Alhamdulillah, if you do this with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your sincerity will bear you out. The truth will bear you out. And I think you do have no other, no other worries, yeah? That you need to cut corners, you need to do all sorts of things just because you want to please one or two people and displease a lot more people because of your own self-interest. So that istikama to me means that way. Once you take a position and you know that position is the one that you want to hold on to and you're quite sure that's the position that you want to defend, then you defend. But if your position is wrong by any means, yeah, then be humble enough to change it. Uh, I'm not saying that again. Yeah, You need to stick to it even though it's wrong after a while. Uh, for example, yeah, if I say now, uh, as a rector of IUM, you can, you can uh, defend yourself uh, through virus by injecting uh, uh, any disinfectant. Katalah. Yeah? And somebody say, hey, Rector, this is wrong. Now, I cannot say, no, no, it is right. You know? I will say this, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, disinfectant, you cannot uh, inject it. Uh, you will die first before the virus gets onto you. So these are, these are the humility part. These are also the istikama part. And these were the balance that I talked to you about. It is often not a one-way traffic. It is the balancing act that bring truth, and we are here in the university to look for truth. And once the truth is approached, then I think we, inshallah, will be there. But the courage that I talked to you about is something which is real, at least in Malaysia. To have the courage to stand by your position and not be compromised just because somebody says something else without inspection or without any basis for it. I hope Shafiq, I think I know Shafiq. Uh, I hope Shafiq... Uh, understands it, otherwise she can call me on the phone. Thank you very much. Um, can, now we are reaching to Tafnon. Uh, Tansi, can we allow another one question? Before? Go ahead, go ahead. I can I can stay with you one whole day. Not a problem. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, okay, Tansi, uh, can I allow uh, one question from the Zoom audience? Yes. Because we talk to from the group chat. Yep. Anybody want to ask questions? Assalamualaikum Tan Sri. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi This is Suhaimi from Club Economics. Oh, Suhaimi. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Tan Sri. Work from home. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, Tan Sri, are you talking how, about... How's the orang kampung, by the way? Alhamdulillah. All well. Alhamdulillah. So, they already start working and do some small business. Okay. Uh, so Tan Sri, talking about, talking about the social... Um, so solidarity uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, we're talking about we are in the big organizations we have uh, hierarchies departments uh, very mechanistic yeah. uh, the the work the gap is widening yeah. and and uh, furthermore people are uh, divided by you know blocks building distance yeah. and when come to solidarity is like a uh, very difficult and even the faculty members also uh, d divided. Now it's more when uh, we don't meet anymore, just on uh, Zoom, etc. So how you know it, it is challenging during the face to face? We already have problem with we already had this uh, what I call a social distancing. Mm -hmm. Now with this uh, work from home, more distant. Then how how can we achieve the sejahtera of uh, social solidarity and to have also the shared responsibility? So this is the
very challenging. This is what I felt now. Uh, becoming lonely at home without the colleagues, only on Zoom, on screens. We don't have the touch, the spiritual touch and etc. So what is your response, Dansri? Thank you. My, my, I can only answer for myself. Uh, I don't know how, how, how other people view this, but I think it's a sense of purpose. Uh, me, I think the sense of purpose. Remember, uh, sudden, one day I, 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 I emailed you and say, how is Orang Kampung? You know, uh, have they got enough to eat? Uh, are they do, 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 do they need help and stuff like that? Uh, I think it's a sense of purpose that binds us. Uh, my sense of purpose and your sense of purpose, if it's the same, then we are together. It doesn't matter where we are, uh, how far we are apart, because that sense of purpose will keep us in touch. I will be reminded of you. You will be reminded of me. Uh, when I say, uh, when I say, what happened to Swami? Whether he see, is he all right at the Puntida? You know? Uh, so it is not the building. It is not the place. Sometimes we sit in the same room. Uh, we do not even share the same as a sense of purpose. Yeah? Uh, one nak jadi professor, satu lagi nak jadi uh, I mean the way the way the way we craft our own uh, apa tu, uh, aspiration also not the same. So bagi university like IUM, I think our sense of purpose must be the same, and this is where we go on and and keep on telling ourselves uh, this Khalifa Amana. Ikrok and Rahmatan Lil Alamin. It's a sense of purpose that all of us must share. If you don't share the sense of purpose in IIUM, then I don't see why you must be in IIUM. You know, you must as well go to some other places that have got a different sense of purpose that is akin to you. Uh, then I think you'll be more, you'll be more, uh, 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 in tune or comfortable in the in that particular issue. So bagi kita di sini ni, uh, my my my. Articulation is basically it's not where it's not where the building is it's not who you are, uh, but what are we here for? And in this context of coronavirus, now we know it is not just the disease. The disease, I think, is just a symbol. I think what we are here for, the disease has told us there is mass inequitability, and this is why the flattening the curve becomes an important agenda to me. You know, orang yang ada banyak accumulation of wealth ini. Uh, you are not uh, doing your, your 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 duty in the sense of sharing what you've got with other people. When other people are basically dying uh, because of lack of food, lack of money, lack of shelter, and here you are with your own castle uh, that you've just fend for yourself. That I think is the message for this coronavirus. Uh, the disease, uh, people die, yeah, that probably is, is a symptom of it. But at the end of the day, how do you then equalize? That's why this is going to talk about humanizing education. How do you make human being out of education? We are not going to make entrepreneurs out of education. We are not going to make millionaires out of education. We are not going to make engineers out of education. Those are secondary. They must be human purpose. Once a human, then bila dia jadi millionaire, dia tahu apa nak buat. Once dia jadi human, dia jadi engineer, dia tahu apa nak buat. Yeah, so we need to reconstruct Bali. the whole idea of what this university is all about. It's about elevating the moral, the dignity of the university to a level that everybody becomes equitable. May not be 100%, but at least the jurang or the gap between one and another will be tolerable. Yeah, and in, again, here Ramadan reminds us. Uh, the, 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 the zakat that we give, the sadaqah that we give, yeah, looking after the neighbors, all of these are about equitability. It's no, no longer pasar Ramadan that the, the orang besar beli kereta banyak-banyak. I, I was reading the dalam 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 uh, internet the, the, in Thailand. Yeah, the billionaires now call Grab, uh, equivalent to Grab, I may not be Grab, sorry. Uh, to their house, they bring the food. Not only they bring the food, they set the table, they wash the, the dishes. Uh, it's almost like setting up a restaurant in their house, you know, uh, because they can afford it. But this is not what this is all about. So I, your question to me is basically, what is the sense of purpose? Why are we here? And the coronavirus tells us why we are here, because we need to uh, look after each other. We need to fend for one each other. We need to, uh, you know, uh, be mindful of each other, not just ourselves. Uh, and then I think we we got the right sense of purpose, and I think we can easily work with one another. You know, 
Uh, but unless and un, un, unless and until that happens, then this tension will be will be there all the time. And I need then we need to sort out what the tension is all about. I hope I've answered your question, Nazmi. Yeah, thank you very much, Tansri. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swami. Um, Tansri, one question coming up from the uh, group chat. This yes. is from Rosidia D. Norden from UKM. Yes. Um, the question is, uh, a resilient leader also has to make a difficult decision to move forward. Yes. Share with us uh, useful tips when in a such situation. Decision is difficult if you don't know what where the end point is. Yeah? But when you know what the end point is, then decision is not difficult. To me, what is the end point? The end point is justice. All right? There are two types of leaders. One, the end point is power. The other end point is justice. Now, Al Ghazali tells us the end point of leadership is justice, not power. All right? And this is sometimes where academicians and politicians do not see eye to eye. Yeah? When we academicians talk about justice, the politicians want to talk about power. And we cannot condone that because then it will move away from our ideal of what leadership is all about. At the end of the day, whatever decision that I make as a rector, I want to ask myself, have I been just to as many people as I could? And sometimes it's not easy, but that is the end point that I want to arrive at. It's not because I want to do this, it will enhance my power, my contract will be renewed, I'll get another country at the end of the day, and that is not my end point. My end point is how much of justice do I am able to dispense? Yeah. And justice, you can also say, how much happiness can you bring to the organization? Sometimes justice is difficult to say. How much happiness can you bring to the organization? How much people will say, I want to stay with this organization because it touches me. You know, Bukan kata, I want to run from this organization. No, this organization is a horrendous organization. Those are the, those are the end points I think that you need to decide. And once you decide what the end point is, then I think the decision making is just a matter of trying to, uh, to move as much as possible to that end point that you want to. So you, you want to, if you cannot make uh, the, the decision yourself, you want to assemble your, uh, your, your top management, you, know, you want to consult with the people below you, uh, you want to find out what is, uh, uh, you know, what's the best mechanism. For me, for example, I'm new here. Uh, they have got the 35 years experience of what it's all about. I need to find out what has been happening the last 35 years. Has this been tried out? If this is tried out, is this successful? If it's successful, do, do are people happy? Uh, only or, or is it or two or three people? So these are these are the areas of leadership uh, that I think that we need to exercise. And I that kind of a leader needs to also uh, tell you that the leadership must go down to the ground, must talk to the people. And that matters, not just stay in your room, you know, and make decisions uh, out of a context that you probably uh, do not understand. So uh, this leadership things that we talked about is more difficult than, than it is because it will then uh, bring about uh, other mechanisms to play and that mechanism is something that you need to ensure that it runs smoothly. And, 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 and I go back to the end point now. What is the end point? As you as a leader now, what is your end point? Because your end point is about yourself, then I think you may want to reconsider because leadership is not just about yourself, it's about everybody around you. And your, your position perhaps is the last in this particular context. So the moment you understand where your end point is, then I think decision making is slightly uh, easier in this particular context. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Tansri. Now, uh, last question. Uh, I would like to open from the Zoom viewers. Uh, anybody want to ask the last questions? Yes, Tansri. Yes. Assalamualaikum. Tak apa nak dengar. Ah, boleh dengar. Boleh, boleh. But try to catch you. Uh, try speak slowly. <laughs> Your energy to bamboo is excellent. Thank you. My question is, yeah, my question is, uh, how can we make people re go back to nature? They they often forget nature. Yes. You refer to nature being resilient, but people are not going back to nature. Yeah. 
that is because uh, Tan Sri, if I if I if I if I may, I think you are you are a forest person. You know this better than I do, because we have isolated education into a building. Education is not supposed to be confined into just a building. I mean, uh, often time when people go to uh, to education, they will ask. Uh, you know, uh, how big is your classroom? How good is your library? Uh, what sort of lab have you got? You know, uh, which is a valid question, but they don't even understand what is the environment around that, that building. I mean, I, 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 we've seen enough of this. Yeah? Uh, nice building, nice structures. Uh, the environment around them, people tak peduli pun. In other words, you are just confining your knowledge on tacit, on, on, on formal knowledge that is captured or codified in books, but you don't look at nature as a source of, 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 uh, of knowledge. You don't look at experience outside as a source of knowledge. I, I'm very critical and I'm, I'll voice it again. Kita ada misalnya uh, uh, CEO at faculty. These are top-notch uh, you know, performers in, in the corporate world. Fine, yeah. But what about the people in, 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 in other sectors that are not confined in the corporate world? Uh, we do not meet them. Uh, people like Misalnya, the equivalent like yourself or David Attenborough, you know, he has got a different experience altogether and not just the corporate world, but we don't, don't even recognize them. Neither do we touch them because we think that he's not knowledge. Our knowledge has been codified in such a way that it comes only from books. It doesn't come from nature. So this whole idea of what education is all about, I think the coronavirus is telling us, look, there is more than just books. There is more than just uh, you know, libraries. Uh, so the practices of people, the cultural practices of people is part of knowledge. You will not be able to solve this, this coronavirus issue, uh, Tansi, if you don't understand the culture uh, of certain people, for example. Yeah? Uh, I think that dimension, when I talked about uh, in, in my talk, is where we missed it. We just talk about economic. Education now is just about economics. yeah, And that's why we, we zero down to uh, employability, uh, uh, employment. As long as they're employed, uh, it's OK. But if they're employed and destroy the nature, it's also OK. Because our basic is just employment. So we need to come back to what, what education is all about. And I hope this coronavirus tells us, because this coronavirus bagi saya is a kind of a eye opener, as an equalizer. Now you have a lot of money, you want to go and get treated, you cannot go to America and, anymore because they can't even provide you a bed. You, know? uh, you need to stay here. So your money has no value anymore. Uh, Dulu, you got heart problem, you go to Mayo Clinic and get all the best that there is. Now they tell you money does not mean anything anymore until and unless you start to equalize. And this equalizing is where nature comes in. Because in nature is a, is a, is a best equalizer as far as, as far as I can see. I'm happy, Tansi in Gombak. I got mountains in front of me, this green mountain. Eh? Uh, every day I look at it. I'm trying to also bring my, my colleagues out into into the into nature and make nature as part and parcel of the uh, apa ni, uh, apa ni, the library that we need to source out. Uh, I hope I, I I I have given you and it's not just the forest. I think it's a, a whole nature that we talked about. I I think I just want to finish by saying that the moment we are locked up, yeah, I think the moment we are locked up, we find that nature uh, breathes uh, more freely. Animals are out. Even in my campus, I nampak a heron. Uh, I see a wild boar coming out. I see a, a wild chicken coming out. A wild fowl coming out. You know, all these things are there, hidden for a long time because we have been monopolizing the place. The moment we let these people also some space, then we begin to see how beautiful nature is. Thank you for the question, uh, Tan Sri. I hope we are able to do something about it. Uh, inshallah. Yeah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Um So I believe we have reached to the end of the session. Um, I may ask Tansri to uh, give some last points to the audience, Tansri. Well, my, my humble last point is basically we need to be who we are. I think we need to be the human being we are. And this is where I think Tan Sri Saleh has a question. The moment we understand we are, then we understand suddenly we are part of nature. 
and we part part of nature, then we need to build our relationship with nature. We are not that single paragon uh, human being because we have got brains, because we have moved uh, to the moon, and therefore we need to destroy everything that is around us that do not meet our standards. Yeah, that's first thing. And human being has got what we call the human scale. We cannot build anything which is more, which is bigger than we are, because we are not able to control it. Now the tendency now is to make things bigger and bigger and bigger. As we build things bigger and bigger, we will lose control. At the end of the day, this is what is going to happen. Yeah. So I think we need to understand the human scale. The human scale allows us to do only certain things that is within our control. Beyond that, I think we are just going to destroy ourselves. So this whole idea of growth, thing. We need to reintrospect it, think about it. Nothing grow and grow and grow and grow. Human being tells us that you cannot grow forever. You will die at one point. The only thing that grows forever is the cancer cells. Now you know what happens to cancer cells. Cancer cell will die at the end of the day because they cannot stop growing. Now we need to take those lessons. Those are lessons from nature. Those are lessons not from societies. Those are lessons you know from nature that tells us look. If you go against this nature, punya apa ni, uh, what you call uh, understand of resiliency, I think we are going to go into a, a space that we will not be able to come out. People like me, okay, I'm already now 70 years old. I probably will not have much years to live. But think of the younger generation that we are responsible for. If we don't put this right. I think we are all going to be accountable for this, inshallah. So I, my, my suggestion is go back to ourselves, understand ourselves, lead ourselves, and I think the rest will follow suit, inshallah, dalam konteks ini. Yeah. So I would like to thank everybody for 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 the rambling that I've got. Uh, it it certainly gives me an encouragement uh, to to think more about this, and I hope we can come up with some sort of a solution. When the government say uh, education is this way, I thought we will probably have our own. Uh, understanding of what education is, uh, given the experiences that we have uh, for these few months and maybe the years to come, inshallah. So, terima kasih banyak, and I apologize for whatever uh, shortcomings and mistakes that I make. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have a better Ramadan uh, moving forward. So, selamat uh, berpuasa, selamat berbuka. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Sri. Uh, I am sure that everyone has benefited from your input and wisdom. So, on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, Dr. Abdul Rahim uh, ED MST, and also um, the members of PMA, I would like to express our sincere thanks to Yang Bahagi Tan Sri Emeritus, um, Dr. Zikri Abdul Razak, for his willingness to spend uh, his time with us. Uh, I also would like to convey our sincere appreciation to each and every one who has participated in our session for today. Um, before we adjourn, could I request uh, all participants to uh, switch on your video camera in order for the secretary to take picture of all of our cheerful image. <laughs> uh, this one uh, we would like to record in our archive. <laughs> So you may switch on the, your video. Okay, the secretary will. Uh...